Amen. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you guys today. And I do want to assure you, we have been doing what we can to improve uh, the temperatures in this building. Uh, however, when we fill it with this many BTUs, uh, it, it becomes a little bit difficult. So if you guys could all get refrigerated vests before you walk in the door. <laughs> no, we've uh, been making improvements to the air conditioner. And uh, I ended up, you know, I'm a pastor, not uh, a HVAC guy. So, you know, I went to Costco and bought a couple of those little portable AC units. And then somebody who actually knows things came to me and said, yeah, that's not going to help you at all. <laughs> you just wasted $600. I'm like, well, OK. So those are going back. But uh, yeah, we're doing everything we can. And uh, so I, I, I thank you guys for bearing with us. Um, but my one thing, you know, when my son was complaining, I wouldn't say this to you guys, but when my son was complaining, I told him, just, I, I told him, just be thankful that you're not attending a church in Kenya because <laughs> it's 110 with humidity and no air conditioning anywhere near you. That's actually when we go to Belize, it'll be, you know, sometimes around 90 degrees with all this humidity. And yeah, the church does not have air conditioning. So they just have fans going and, and people bring their own little fans. And there we go. But yes, Lord, we need a building. We are praying for that. Uh, we're going to be in the book of 1 John. And so if you guys want to turn there, I'll just give a little intro about why this, uh, this book in particular is so near and dear to my heart uh, because God used this as a foundational book that, that just changed everything about my life. I was uh, going to church against my will. My parents were dragging me there. I had gotten myself into just all kinds of financial trouble. And so I ended up having to move back in with my parents, and the one requirement they had is that I attend church with them, and so I reluctantly went, um, but I was this young punk who uh, I honestly don't remember what color of hair I had at the time. It could have been purple, it could have been blue, could have been green, like quite literally I had, you know, every color of the rainbow almost, and uh, I, I did what I could to make sure that people knew like, you know, I'm, I'm not one of you. Like, I, I don't fit in here. And so when I, I went to church, I was just this sore thumb sticking out of a uh, church where, you know, the average age of the, the person attending there was in the upper 60s. And uh, this is a little church in Coeur d'Alene, Bethel Baptist. It's no, no longer there. But I had the pastor uh, approach me and, and say, uh, well, first, as he approached me, I was kind of excited because I thought he was going to kick me out of the church because of the way that I looked. Like, you know what? It's just not working. You don't fit in here. Bye. There's the door. Change how you look or don't come back. And I was thinking, all right, I don't have to go to church anymore. And the guy said, I want to disciple you. And my first reaction was, why? <laughs> why? But this guy had a heart that was just so full of grace, so full of love that he saw somebody uh, that nobody else, uh, you know, most other people wouldn't give me the time of day. And he told me he wanted to disciple me. So he took me through the book of 1 John. And he asked me to read it once a day, every day. And then we would meet and talk about it. And it was just in that time that God really grabbed a hold of my heart, taught me what grace was. And uh, just, it, it broke me. It came to a point where I knew, all right, I've thrown my entire life up to this point. I've thrown it in the trash. And okay, God, here I am. And uh, if, if we're going to do this, then I want to do this for real. And uh, it's been no turning back since then. So this book is very, very special to me. Uh, the interesting part, though, uh, I don't believe that this book is any more special than any of the other books of the Bible. Uh, because, uh, you know, there's this pro skateboarder named Christian Hosoi who had grown up in a life, uh, his dad was consumed with drugs and alcohol, uh, grew up uh, on the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, his, his dad was a partier, and he was just this reckless kid, and uh, ended up uh, in, in his pro skateboarding career uh, trying to transport drugs, I believe internationally, but caught, caught in the United States, and so that was prison time. So he's in prison, 
And uh, a, a guy gave him a Bible, and he opened it up to 1 Kings. And he understood the gospel through 1 Kings. That's the Lord, because <laughs> if you read through 1 Kings, there's not a whole lot of the gospel that's, you know, actively portrayed. Uh, but that's God. And, and God can do that. And so the, his entire counsel, his entire word is special. And uh, so we're just going to jump into this this morning uh, in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. And John writes, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that you have preserved for us for all these years. God, that we can sit here in wrath from Idaho in this time and this place and receive from you. God, we just pray that you would speak your word to each one of our hearts. God, I know that you have a different message for each and every one of us. Your, your message to us is as unique as each one of us are. So Lord, we invite you to do business with us. God, whatever needs to be done, God, examine our hearts. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there really is a big difference between belief and knowledge, it, it, at least in the way that many of us use the word belief today. Uh, often when someone says that they believe something, they'll say, this is what I believe. Uh, their basis for belief is usually just a, a hopeful guess, or it was maybe something that they were just raised and taught to believe. Or it could be something that they were just told to uh, by another person, uh, whether it be a friend, an organization, or maybe it's a guy hosting a YouTube channel in his mom's basement. And, you know, this guy said it, so I believe it. Uh, and unfortunately, I think there's way too many people getting their information from guys doing YouTube channels in their mom's basements. But, um, you know, when, when I was 14, it's funny because I can still very, very vividly remember this day. There's, I've got friends from way back when where they'll bring up something. Hey, do you remember when we did this? I'm like, I have no recollection of that whatsoever. And then there's times, well, I'll bring, I'll bring something up and they're going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Are you sure? And, uh, but I so vividly remember this time. We were hanging out at my friend Pete's house and, and we were riding bikes in the park behind his house. You know, it was a hot day, so we come in, and we're all hanging out around the kitchen island, drinking lemonade, and, uh, and, and we start talking about uh, the God creation, purpose for life. You know, kids out there solving all the world's big problems. And, uh, and, and there we are, and the things that we're expressing, though, they were all ideas that were either just hopeful imaginations or just a regurgitation of things that were taught to us by others. Uh, none of us had any experiential knowledge of the things that we were talking about. Uh, and that includes me. E even though I believed in Jesus and uh, I, I received from him his, his forgiveness for my sins, I had salvation, I didn't have an experiential walk with God. I was simply taught things about God, and I received them, but I had very, very little confidence that these things were actually true. So therefore, the things that we claimed to believe were simply things that we could have been easily dissuaded from. I don't think if any of us had a $100 bill in our pocket that we would be willing to lay it down on our claims about God and about existence. Uh, because none of us had any confidence or surety. We didn't know. Um, and, and, and so that's not how God would have us walk through this world as Christians. 
He doesn't want Christians who are simply Christians because their parents were. He wants a real, genuine relationship with each and every one of us so that we would have the confidence to say not only that we believe, but that we know. And, and this is one of the reasons that the Apostle John ever wrote the books of the Bible that he did. In, in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 13, as he kind of concludes the book, he says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This isn't just we're going to cross our fingers and hope we picked the right way and hope we did enough good things and hope that, that we went to church enough times. And God doesn't want any of our thoughts, minds, and hearts being fixed on something that, that's that temporary. He wants us to be able to know that we know. And, and like all the martyrs of history in the Christian church, of people who are assured of their salvation. There's no question mark, there's no what if, it's they know and they are sure of it. And that's how God wants each of us to be. So John starts here in, in uh, verse one, talking about the eternal nature of Christ. He, he says, what was from the beginning? And so the, the beginning, it's talking about the origin or the active cause behind the existence of something. We have to remember that Christ is eternal. He, he was not created the day that he appeared in the manger. That was not when Jesus' life began. In fact, when the beginning began, Christ already was. Which is something, it's such a mind bender for us. Because we're, we're in a finite world, we have finite brains, and we think very linear, linear from beginning, middle, end. And, and it's often the question of who created God then? Well, in order, we live in this box of uh, time, space, and matter. To be able to exist within that box, or actually to bring that box into existence, wouldn't you therefore have to be outside of that? And so to create time, you would have to be outside of time. So when the beginning began, Jesus already was. He was already there. And uh, you look at, at Jesus' conversation, or we'll probably put it more accurately, his argument with the Pharisees in, in John chapter 8. And they were going back and forth, and man, they're throwing insults and low blows, and, and Jesus is just answering them point for point on all these things. But he tells them, he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they look at him and go, now we know you're crazy. You're not even 50 years old, and you're telling us that you've seen Abraham? And Jesus' response to them was, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so what, what he was telling him was, in the Greek, ego eimi, and he's, that, that claims a constant state of existence. Abraham had a beginning of existence. Christ has always existed. Jesus has always been. And this is how we know that we can put our hope and our faith and, and our salvation within his hands because he was not just some man who was born who was just better than the rest of us who just did all the right things. He was the perfect kid and, and checked all the spiritual boxes. And man, that, that's a life that you can follow after. That's not what Jesus was. Jesus is the God of all creation. He is the one who has always been. He is the one who set everything that we know in order and, and set all the events in place. And so John 1.1 1, 1 also tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's Jesus. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. So when the beginning happened, God already was. So no, to that question of, well, who created God? No one created God. He has always been. And, uh, and, and if he were not, he would be subject to decay just like we are, since he is outside of time and space and matter. Uh, you know, he, he is the one who, who can set all these things together and make everything right. 
And so that's first. He, he puts it out, the eternal nature of Christ, and, and puts that out for us. Um, and it's funny, he does it in just a couple of words, but he said so much in those couple of words. And then from there, he starts to speak about an experiential relationship with Christ. Um, and, and he says there, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John is not coming from a philosophical point of view. He's telling us what he knows about. All of these words that he uses, heard, seen, observed, touched, these are all experiential. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He actually lived with Jesus. And John audibly heard Jesus speak and preach. He had physically seen him. He had intently studied his teachings, had tangibly touched him. He was so close to him, in fact, that on the Last Supper, he was leaning on Jesus's chest. They had such a close relationship that, that there they were after supper, and he was just relaxing and just leaning on him like a brother, like the closest of friends. And then additionally, John also had uh, the blessed experience of being able to see the risen and glorified Jesus in when he was on the island of Patmos, when he wrote in the book of Revelation. And it says that this experience so overwhelmed him that he fell at his feet as though dead, that he just fell face down in fear and worship. And so he got to experience both of those, that, that close, intimate relationship of, of love and friendship and, and then seeing the risen Christ and, and just having that fear of God overwhelm him to the point where he just falls face down. He got to experience both of those. He had seen all these things. Nobody just sat him down in a classroom and explained all these things to him. He saw it. He walked it. He lived it. Paul also writes in, in 2 Timothy 1.12, he says, I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted me until that day. And so notice that. He says, I know whom I have believed. It's not that he was just taught a, a system of rules, a list of do's and don'ts, or even just studied the life of a guy who just did everything right and, and decided, well, I'm going to set my heart and my life to doing everything right just like he did. No, this is, this is a person of God that he knew him and walked with him. And uh, this wasn't just because he walked and talked with him on earth before or even after he was crucified. Because Paul never had that luxury. Paul didn't get to walk and talk with Jesus in the flesh even after he had risen. He, he had an experience with him on the road to Damascus, and, and God spoke to him. Jesus spoke to him. And, and yet he, he never got to live with him in the way that John did. And yet it, it's no less powerful how he says, I know who I have believed. And Peter was able to, to tell us in, uh, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 and 18, he says, we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice when it came from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. And so Peter's saying, you know, it wasn't that people just sat together in a room like me and my friends did around that kitchen island and decided, all right, we're going to come up with a system of beliefs. We're, we're going to figure something out. Let's put it all together. Let's put it on paper and let's tell people about it. That, that's not what happened. These weren't cleverly contrived myths that they were actual eyewitnesses of the majesty of God. They saw him glorified. They, they heard the voice of God speak on the mountain. 
Now, even though we can't go back in time and be with them to see that, God will work in our hearts and in our lives in ways that are no less real. And Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Our faith can be just as genuine and real if we have faith and walk in him. And some people say, I want to see, and then I can believe, or, or give me the proof, and then I'll believe it. But God invites those to, to receive him, to believe it, and then he, he opens a, this room that is just full of evidence all over the place, and, and he says, believe, and you will see. Um, and and with, with my own life, when I, when I came to the Lord, God spoke to me in ways that were so powerful and so undeniable. I didn't really need to research apologetics and, and find out all these different defenses of the faith and, and how much evidence there is behind the resurrection, behind uh, the prophecies about Jesus. There's so much evidence that God has given us in this world. And yet, as God spoke to me, I didn't need all that. Because the work that he did was so real and living and powerful, it was like, okay, God, there is no way I could ever deny who you are because of, of what I had seen. Now, it's great that God still puts those pieces of evidence out there. He doesn't call us just to blindly believe. There is so much out there. And, and I know people who have come to faith who they really did have that stumbling block, that they really wanted to see the evidence. And God is merciful, so he's, he's not telling us, yeah, you can't come to me unless you simply receive in this way. No, there's many people that I know who have done the research, who have looked into apologetics, and have been convinced through the evidence that, that God is who he says he is. Um, and, and yet, even with those people, God will speak to them and work in their lives once their lives are surrendered to him and uh, in, in ways that are absolutely undeniable. And so John tells us that this life, as he's speaking about Jesus, it says was revealed. And so this is very similar to John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14, where uh, these verses, when they're put together, say, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was revealed to John and to the disciples. If we remember back to Nathaniel, when, when he saw Jesus, he saw Jesus but his, his first reaction when he heard about him was, uh, Jesus from Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? So he saw Jesus, but who Jesus was wasn't revealed until Jesus spoke to him and said, when you were sitting under the fig tree, I saw you. And, and we don't know what happened under the fig tree. My guess is that he was, you know, in, in prayer and, and asking God, you know, when are you going to send the Messiah? When are you going to uh, send your son to rescue us? And, uh, and then Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, because immediately he says, you know, my Lord and my God. And, and, and so Nathaniel saw Jesus, but it wasn't until Jesus was revealed that he understood. And so God wants to reveal himself to each and every one of us. There's not a single one of us that he wants us just walking around in the dark wondering about who God is and, and what his thoughts are on our life and where we should be going and, and, and what does he think about all this stuff that's happening in the world. God doesn't want us questioning and just wondering. He wants to be able to give us answers. He wants to walk with us. And uh, he wants to show himself to us so that we could actually know for ourselves, to where it wouldn't be something that, oh, I just know this because somebody else told it to me. Uh, it's so great when you can have time in the Word, and, it, and it's like going into a, a great mine, and you just know that there's gold in there, but when you find gold for yourself, 
Isn't it incredible when God just reveals something to you? You're spending that time in the Word, and, and sure, you're reading it, but then again, it's just kind of like with Nathaniel. Sometimes we can read the Word, and it's just, yeah, yeah, okay, I've read this a hundred times, but then all of a sudden, God just highlights something, and it's almost like it comes off the page and smacks you in the forehead, and God's like, this, and you go, I get it now, and, and so that's how... God wants us to be with him. He wants us to understand and know for ourselves. And when we know his heart and when we know his word, then we can share that with others. It's a natural outflow. And so the third part here is expressing that relationship to other people. Because this is exactly what John does. He says, what we have seen and heard, we declare to you. So John and the rest of the disciples, when, when Jesus rose... When, when they had seen him go up into heaven after he had risen from the grave and walked with them and talked with them, and then he ascended back into heaven, the disciples didn't just sit around in a circle and go, man, aren't we lucky? That was, that was just great. Man, we are just the luckiest people on earth. All right, we can go to our graves now knowing that, that God just loved us so much that we could experience that. No, that, that was not the point of it at all. When, when God does a work in our lives, yes, he wants to minister to us. The, the work is, is, is first primarily for us, but the work is never to stay with us. So the things that John saw and experienced and heard, it was never for him just to keep silently until he went to the grave. The intention of Jesus doing this work in his life was so that John could tell people about it. You know, that, that he could be just so full of joy and so full of excitement that it's just spilling all over the room wherever he goes, that, that people would see and hear and understand. And for each and every one of us, this is, this is our testimony. When he says, we declare to you, it means that we testify, that we give our testimony. And all this is, is simply telling others about a relationship that we have with Jesus, so with a good testimony, it's, it's really just stating the facts, stating uh, just as an um, unemotional observer of, of what happened. That's going to make the be best testimony. Like in a courtroom, if you were to witness a car accident or some kind of crime, um, so often emotion gets involved in that. I had seen a, a courtroom case where a girl claimed that uh, a, a guy that was five foot six punched a guy, uh, five foot six and 135 pounds, punched a guy who was six foot two and probably 240, and that his punch launched the guy eight feet in the air back. <laughs> like, physics. <laughs> um, not really possible. Um, but, you know, there was emotion in the situation. What, what she saw was so dramatic in her mind that, you know, you kind of fill in blanks. Well, you know, often we can get emotions tied up in how we witness to people. And, and all God's doing is saying, you know, just with no pressure, uh, often we have this pressure to feel that we need to close a sale or something like that. Like, I've got to get this person saved. Well, you can't get this person saved. That's between that person and God. There's nothing that you can do to make that happen. Uh, and, and so really, our witness, our testimony is simply stating the facts of, of what God has done in our lives, that, that we're witnesses to, hey, God spoke to me in this way. And I know he can speak to you. And here's, here's how he paid for me. And I know he paid for your sins too. And, and so it's just such a simple thing. And when you remove the emotion of the situation, it becomes a lot easier to reach out to people and just explain what God has done in your life. And I just encourage you guys just to be daily praying for that. As Paul wrote to the church, he, he said, and pray for us that God may open a door that they could effectively preach the gospel. If, if you're praying daily, God, open a door for me today just to show somebody the love of Jesus. And, and, and again, not that we're going around as door-to-door -door salesmen trying to sell Jesus, but we simply show people the love of God that he has shown us. And uh, really, as we look through the history of the Christian church, 
this is what it's been about. The people who were eyewitnesses of these things recorded the things about Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Here we have them today. And, and not just then at the beginning of the church, when the Bible was written, when the New Testament was written, uh, but as the church continued on, God would work in somebody's life and they would share that with others. And those people would come to truly experience God for themselves and they would share that with others. And that is how this room is full of people today is because God has continued to allow his spirit to work and move in people's lives and those people share with others. And, and really what it is, it's an invitation to see for yourself. Andrew, when he invited people, and, and people are asking questions, well, what's this about? He says, come and see. Come check it out. And, and really, that's one of the best parts is, is that we just get to say, well, I don't talk with God. He'll meet with you. I don't have to answer all your questions. Don't g- carry that burden of thinking that you've got to answer every question for every person in the world. You know, just invite them to go speak with God, and God can answer the questions. And then just one last thing about that. The great part about a testimony is people can't refute it. You know, somebody can sit there, and I've, I've had debates with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons at my doorstep. And, you know, they, there's times where, yeah, they, they sounded like they had a more convincing argument that I, than I did. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's not the deal that we're talking about here. What we're talking about is how has God worked in your life? And, and when you have walked it and experienced, nobody can refute that. No, nobody can challenge that. They can call you a liar, um, but if you know you're not lying, then it doesn't matter. So uh, next, he talks about experiencing fellowship with the body of Christ. And he says, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And this word fellowship is so much more than just having things in common, There's people that you can have stuff in common with, that you can hang out, that you can have a good time, that you can enjoy doing certain things together. But when there's true fellowship in Jesus Christ, it's it's completely different. So one of my best friends, uh, I've known him longer than almost anyone other than my own family. Uh, I've been best friends with this guy since we were four, got into all kinds of trouble when we were little kids. We were both kind of wired the same. And uh, our parents, you know, they had many, many, many gray hairs because of both of us. And, uh, you know, as we, he was my first roommate and uh, just friends all through high school and everything. And uh, uh, we really didn't, we went to church growing up. Uh, but neither one of us had a walk with the Lord. And then when I was 23, I received Jesus and started walking with him. He did not. And so we were still, I still remained friends with him. We would still hang out. We would ride mountain bikes and get our families together. Uh, but it was definitely a superficial relationship. And, and I'm not meaning that uh, it, it was... Uh, um, something that I didn't give a lot of thought or concern or care about. It's just the things that we had in common were all surface level, the things that we enjoyed to do. Uh, it, it's not that deep. Uh, and, and then, it was probably six or seven years ago, he came to faith in Jesus. And now the relationship is completely different. You know, we have the fun stuff that we love to do together, and yet at the end of the day, there is a depth of relationship and friendship and camaraderie and that we're able to pray for one another and encourage one another. And, and it's totally different and, and it's so encouraging. And with other be- believers, you can have next to nothing in common other than Jesus and have a relationship that's as close as anything else in the world. I, I remember back to when I was very young in ministry and uh, I went to a, a pastor's conference, and at this conference, I was with another guy who was the same age as me, and we made friends with uh, the t- Tommy and Marie, who were in their upper 60s, were retired, grandparents, all that. Me and Brian had just started new families, had little babies at home, and And so really on the surface, we had nothing in common. We didn't enjoy the same kind of sports or anything like that. 
And yet, these two became our best friends through the whole conference. We went to the lunches together, to dinners together. We sat together for all the studies. And this older couple that just wanted to share Jesus with us. And we were excited to talk about Jesus with them. And, and it was just such a great relationship. And if we have fellowship in Christ, that's the deepest thing that you could ever have fellowship in. And it's such a wonderful thing to be able to see how we can have family, true family, in Jesus Christ. And then John goes one step beyond that, and he says, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus. So this depth of relationship that I'm talking about, what's so much greater than being able to have that with another person being that God that I'm speaking of, the self-existent one that, that was there at the beginning of creation who had set all these things in order, he wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to hang out with us. And it's just mind-blowing to think about that, that this God of all creation not just wants us to be servants, but he wants to walk with us. I love how Jesus told the disciples, he said, I don't call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. And, and so to think about being the friend of God. And, and again, it, as we witness to people, it's more or less like, let me tell you about my friend. I know this guy. And he loves you. And I can tell you because I'm his friend. And he told me that he loves you. And, and so it's one of those things where we can know that we know that we know that we have a friendship with God. And how do you grow a friendship? Through time together. <laughs> you got to hang out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's friendships that I have that where I haven't talked to somebody in five or six or ten years, and then you get together, and, hey, we're just going to pick up right where we left off. Uh, and, and yet God's like, that's not how you grow a friendship, though. Uh, it, it's number one in time, yes, but depth of time, quality of time. It, it can't just be, because you guys have friends where you can hang out for a whole day and you don't ever actually get anything accomplished. No re real business gets done. Uh, and then there's other people, man, you spend 10 minutes with them and it's just like, all right, we've accomplished everything in 10 minutes. All right, we're good to go. Um, but uh, God, God wants length of time, but most importantly, he wants quality of time with us as, as we're uh, sitting before him you know, with a, a purpose-filled heart of saying, God, all right, I want to hear from you. And, and God's like, okay, uh, we can work. We can get things done when we set our hearts aside and ask him uh, to minister to us. Um, you know, when I was young, I would do everything that I could to make sure that I was always around friends. I, I didn't really like being alone. I, I just, I don't know why, I think I felt... If, if I wasn't around friends, that meant I was a loser because I didn't have any friends that were willing to hang out with, whatever. But if I was hanging out with somebody and they had something to do, I'd find somebody very quickly to hang out with because I just always wanted to be around people. And when I started walking with the Lord, I so appreciated my solo time because I was never actually alone. <laughs> You know, you're spending time with the Lord. Uh, I love mountain biking, and I love mountain biking with friends. It's a great thing, but I much more love mountain biking by myself because I'm with the Lord when I do that. And in creation and just being able to, to say, all right, God, let's, let's hang out. Let's spend some time together. And uh, for each one of us, being able to set our hearts aside, finding that time every single day, and saying, okay, God, let's sit down, let's meet. And that's truly how we experience this fullness of joy. And that's the last part that he's talking about. He says, experiencing fullness of joy. We are writing these things to you that your joy may be complete. And when have you ever heard of religion being presented as complete joy? When you hear of religion being talked about in the world, there's, there's just not a lot of joy that's being presented, is there? You know, it's just this, this drudgery, this work, this 
burden that's put on people, and that's not what God wants. Here's what Jesus is supposed to look like when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is saying, I will give you rest if you feel stressed out about trying to be a perfect person, Jesus says, come to me. That's, that's too big of a burden for you to carry. God doesn't want perfect people. God wants broken sinners that, that he can minister to. Uh, a friend sent me a verse just recently in Isaiah 61 um, where, where Jesus says that I will give you beauty for ashes. And I absolutely love that phrase of, You know, when we're trying to do all this on our own, the best that we can come up with is a pile of ashes. And and Jesus says, I will give you beauty for that. And and so we're not supposed to be spinning our wheels on our own, trying to figure out how to be perfect. That's a difficult yoke. That's that's something that that he doesn't want us carrying. So if your yoke is difficult, if your burden is heavy, Jesus wants to take it from you. And, and he wants to replace it with something that he will help you carry that's much easier. And Jesus doesn't ever say that, that life is going to be easy, you know, but he says that he will help carry us. That yoke is, is this thing that's designed to hold two oxen together. And when we're yoked up with him, he's a lot stronger than we are. He can carry the weight. All we have to do is kind of walk alongside him and, and watch him do the work. And, and that's what he's calling us to do. God wants to fill us with joy. And the closer you walk with him, the more joy you experience. And so we're going to have a time of communion now. And uh, this is something for those who have believed in the name of Jesus, who have already received forgiveness of sin through him. If you have not received Jesus Christ into your heart, today is the day. The Bible says, do not harden your hearts. Don't put it off another day. Receive him today. He wants to do this work. He wants to forgive you. He wants to take that heavy burden that you've been carrying and and make it light. And he wants to give you rest. And, and so as we do this for the believer, it's, it's for us to remember the work on the cross that Jesus did how he paid for our sins. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 23 uh, to 26, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus took the bread he, he gave thanks. He broke it. Imagine giving thanks when you know what was about to happen. If I knew that a great trial was right around the corner from me, I probably wouldn't be thanking God for it. You know, am I right that we often will just beg to have the trial removed from us? And Jesus gave thanks knowing what he was about to do. But he broke it and said, this is my body. He didn't have to do that. I love the part in the scripture where Jesus says, I have the power to lay my life down and the power to take it up again. And that power to lay his life down, he could have stopped it at any moment. He didn't have to go through what he went through. That took strength. That took power. And he did it. He went through all of that for you and I to have this relationship with us. So he says, when we do this, when we take this communion, that that we do that in remembrance of him. And it says in verse 25, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. As, as 
John the Baptist explained when, when he was coming toward him. He said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The blood that he shed removed our sin completely if we come to him and accept it. And as we do this, as we take this communion and remember that, it sets things in order in our lives. It's a time for us to be examined by the Lord. And, and what are we pursuing after? What's the main goal and focus of our life today? You know, we can have a stated main focus and goal that, that we're going towards, but then often in reality, the thing that we're chasing after is, is in a different direction. And so as we have this time together, it's for each one of us to examine our own hearts and then allow God to examine our hearts and say, where am I at? What am I chasing after? What are the things that are important to me right now that I shouldn't be worried about? What are the, what are the things that should be important to me that I'm honestly not very concerned about right now? And, and as we do these things, if we do it with honesty, God will speak to us. And so that each one of us can know that we know that we know that we're walking with him and that we're where we need to be. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us. Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us that's in this building, that there would not be one person left who is just resistant to your forgiveness and your gospel, your love for them. Lord, I just pray that every single heart here would be torn in a good way for you. Lord, that you would be able to minister to us, to build us up, to strengthen us, to fill us with your love and your joy. God, that we can share that with others. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we have here together with one another. And ultimately, Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we have in you. God, I just pray that you would strengthen your church today. Help each one of us to have the eyes of God for this world. Lord, that we would see things as you see things, that we would love others as you have loved us. God, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.